absolutely um, delighted and uh, and thrilled to have been appointed professor of practice um, at the Soho University of London and um, in your Center for Global Finance um, that you that you direct. And um, I think we go um, uh, back quite a long time, so two decades ago, I think we um, we were writing uh, chapters in um, in books together together. Uh, uh, about FDI and, and financial capital market, uh, financial uh, capital markets, and um, uh, and over time we have interacted a lot uh, about uh, research on the global financial crisis. Um, remember in Kenya uh, that we did a lot of work, and also um, and of course I've, I've followed your um, your research program in in in, in great detail um, uh, around the um, sort of financial markets in uh, in Africa, and I've got huge admiration um, both for uh, of course, your um, your your the output, the, the journal articles, the research that has been provided, but also for the, the excellent networks that you um, that you have uh, uh, brought to it, uh, and and of course are, are, are maintaining. Let me also uh, express my gratitude to SOAS more generally. Um, my, my my day job is uh, is I'm at a ODI. I'm a director for international economic development, and um, but half to three quarters of the team and about 10, 15 people. Um, uh, have had um, over time have had a, a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD from SOAS, and so there's a lot of interaction between sort of SOAS and uh, and ODI, and so there's a lot of interaction and also um, uh, sort of more widely about SOAS. So let me um, uh, begin uh, sort of the, uh, the lecture, and also thank you very much for for assembling um, uh, such a um, uh, uh, distinguished uh, set of people. Okay. Um, let me go to the first slide, and I hope you can all see it. Um, and so I'll be talking about development finance institutions in Africa, shaping future research uh, directions. Um, now it's going to be a, a PowerPoint about 20, 25 minutes, so it's going to be a lot on it, um, and it's going to be circulated later. So if you miss a few, a few things, uh, don't don't worry. Um, so the, the, the task that um, uh, that I've set myself um, for this uh, this 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 this, uh, this sort of uh, inaugural lecture is to uh, shape uh, a research agenda on development finance institutions in Africa, um, and an agenda which is both informed by and inspires practice. And so I'd like to sort of build on my own practical experience on development finance institutions. And uh, um, uh, I've done have some practical experience of it, as, as Victor already mentioned. So I've advised a range of bodies and, um, and administrators um, around um, around DFIs uh, over the last sort of 15, uh, 15 years uh, of work and also work on economic transformation. Uh, and I've had a chance to work with African leaders and also um, fantastic African researchers as well. And of course, I'd like to bring these two strands also together. And, and so the, the key message, uh, I think, um, up front that I'd like to sort of um, highlight is that um, I think that there are the expectations from and the actions by development finance institutions are changing. They have been changing over the last decade, two decades, and they've been turned turn from sort of mere investors, um, uh, thinking about investment project, project, into major development players. Um, and uh, and I think this the research agenda needs to both reflect this um, and so assess whether it has worked, um, but also the research agenda should inform these changes further. So what, what is the future for development finance institutions? Um, good. Oops. Then. Um, so uh, let me just briefly talk a bit about sort of uh, definitions and focus and instruments and sectors of DFIs. So. Development finance institutions are um, institutions, then they can be international and national in nature, regional, um, and they can provide finance uh, for the public sector, the private sector, uh, and uh, sometimes it, they do both. Um, and um, But we're, of course, talking about those um, DFIs that operate in, in Africa. Uh, there are a lot. Um, so there are, uh, one publication comes that there are about 110 uh, uh, development banks, um, national and regional uh, development banks, and uh, so there's some major ones and some very tiny, uh, tiny ones as well. Um, now in this lecture, uh, I'd like to focus on international development finance institutions, um, not necessarily, necessarily domestic or national development banks, which I think is also really important, um, and those that, that that aim to provide finance to the private sector. In Africa, so particularly uh, focusing on European development finance institutions, 
the EIB, European Investment Bank, uh, which is perhaps more on the uh, particular private sector side, and um, the IFC, uh, in terms of finance cooperation, which is part of the World Bank Group. Uh, but of course, it has wider implications, I would argue as well, uh, for, for, for other DFIs as well. The distinction feature of development finance institutions, in my view, is that they provide targeted finance and they are complementary to capital markets. So firms in, 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 in African countries can, can raise capital from, from, uh, from the capital markets, from stock markets and so on. But there is also complementary to that, there are funds that can be put in place. And these funds um, uh, that, uh, can, um, that can invest um, do so and hope to sort of address market failures in capital markets. So the capital markets themselves uh, fail to allocate resources, for example, to um, often to long term finance, such as infrastructure or, or climate finance. And you need dedicated funds for this DFIs um, supported by by governments. Um, these international DFIs provides uh, as, uh, private sector uh, with finance in the form of loans often. So that's usually more than half in the, in, in the portfolios, followed by equity that is a bit less than half and a tiny percentage goes to guarantees. They provide finance to the financial sector, um, so funds, uh, intermediate funds, um, and um, uh, so about a third, about a third of their their investment goes to infrastructure, both transport and energy infrastructure, and then there's other sectors as well. Um, <clears throat> Now, if you look at, uh, at some of the data, and that is almost like a research project on its own, or a, a PhD or a professorship on its own, looking at the data of, of the advice is not an easy, an easy task, as uh, as many uh, in this research community will uh, will recognise. Um, but you can start of sort of bringing some data together, um, uh, and maybe sometimes it's a bit of apples and pears. But if you if you look at the ATFIS, the European Development Finance Institutions, the IFC, the EIB, and if you bring that together and you compare, for example, 2005 2021, then you find that the the annual investment um, um, it has uh, has increased fivefold between 2005 to 2021, and that has increased much faster than. For example, foreign direct investment, so the private investment that has gone into Africa, which has also increased uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, about twofold over that period. And DFI finance uh, of the DFIs I mentioned have, have risen faster than a total gross fixed capital formation um, in, in, um, in, in Africa. And sort of combined, that's, um, um, the DFIs that I mentioned are now worth about 2% of, uh, of the investment. Um, they're also uh, quite sizable players now in terms of GDP, so the total income. So they have become bigger players over time, and and I would argue they're big players. They should have a macro impact now as well. Oops. Um, now, then the um, shareholders, uh, and they're mostly uh, individual governments or or a range of governments uh, for the for the international DFIs, but can also be um, be, be banks and so on. Uh, they can also be shareholders, for example, in the FMO in the Netherlands. They set um, uh, the shareholders set multiple objectives to um, to DFIs, and um, and there are at least four, and some of them are complementary, and some may be conflicting. And so DFIs need to be additional to the market. Uh, the market itself, if it can do, it can, it can provide finance to the private sector, then you don't need to intervene, right? Um, but the, the DFIs also like to, uh, like the, um, or the shareholders also like the DFIs to mobilize additional private capital. Um, so that they leverage in new private sector uh, finance. Um, and those two sometimes uh, go hand in hand, but sometimes they're not the same. Because if you, if you, for example, think about a global financial crisis, then capital is, is, is withdrawing from countries. Um, then it's very easy for a DFI to be additional to the market because private sector withdraws. But um, because the uh, uh, private sector is withdrawing, it's very difficult to mobilize additional capital. So you already have a sort of bit of a conflict there. Shareholders also want DFIs to have um, to, to sort of be uh, not lose money, because um, if you invest and you don't get your money back, then at some point um, you can't invest anymore. So you want to have sort of like a revolving fund. So you need to finance on commercial terms. You don't want to be loss making. But at the same time, 
We also want DFIs to have a major development impact. So you want to have them uh, impact on the sustainable development goals. And, and of course, within them, there are already uh, different um, different objectives. Um, but if you think a bit about that, that, that sometimes um, investment in a, in a profitable enterprise, or often, um, will will create a lot of development impact. Um, um, and without uh, having profits, making profits, the investment would not be sustainable. Um, and in the longer term, that would not be, create jobs, right? So you wouldn't have any impacts. Um, but uh, amongst the profitable uh, projects, some have a bigger impact on development than others. So it's not always sometimes compromise, but conflicting. Um, in terms of um, um, sort of all the uh, development over time, um, I would argue that that uh, these international DFIs have developed in a major way uh, over, um, over time, but perhaps not not sufficiently. Um, I, when I started work, looking at into DFIs in 2000, when I joined the Overseas Development Institute (ODI), the, the most of the DFIs were, were obscure. Um, they, I didn't know um, uh, much about them, and the development community more, more widely didn't know much about the CDCs, the IFCs um, uh, of this world at, 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 at that time. Um, and but they have grown um, uh, into um, much bigger players, and they have been drafted into all sorts of policy statements, such as the Addis Ababa action agenda uh, to finance sustainable development goals. And, uh, and these days, there's lots of discussion about blended finance, and of course, DFIs play an important role. The research community has done some catch up, but initially didn't do much uh, much work apart from micro level monitoring. And, it's, and, and of course, over time, the last decades, it has gone quite far into harmonizing impact standards and uh, additional uh, research has um, um, has come to um, uh, to light. Um, and uh, if we, for example, take the impact on jobs measurement, um, that has has developed over time. Um, initially in the year 2000, I remember uh, being in seminars and the shareholders, they would stand up and say, we provide finance uh, through DFIs into poorer countries, into Africa. Um, and because we provide capital, that's got to be good for development. That's got to be good for jobs. Um, so it was assumed. Um, of course, then uh, we wanted to have a bit more accountability and, and initial and anecdotal evidence came up um, so that, uh, that, that, that that device did have an impact. And then over time uh, in the FMO and IFC, um, you had the bean counters, well, bean counters, perhaps the, sort of the, the monitors who, who say, well, actually, how many jobs are being uh, supported in the companies that we invest in? Um, uh, how, many, how many taxes do they pay? Uh, how much carbon dioxide uh, emissions are, are prevented by them? Um, this was just in their investee companies, but of course, if you if you invest, then it doesn't only help that particular sector, but it also helps other sectors. Um, and you can use input output models for that. That's a Soviet planning idea that came into uh, into uh, emergent in the 60s, and that became um, has now become into use by many DFIs actually um, to sort of understand what is the job impact. And then there are a range of other uh, act techniques that have come into place. Um, uh, artful estimator, the econometric magicians, the, doing the sort of the very detailed randomized control trials or, uh, or micro level econometrics. Um, and then you had the systems uh, thinkers, uh, the, macro, uh, the macro effects. And, and then there are the people who say it all depends, the, the proper economists, right? They, they say, well, the, it depends on the context. Um, and uh, and actually, that's going to be a major point in my in my lecture as well. That actually they need to think about the context, the the, the African policy context. Um, and um, uh, if we go to the next slide, there is a um, then thinking about and the impact of FDI of DFIs in Africa. Uh, it's really important to do this. There's a huge um, uh, uh, financing gap. Um, uh, Estimated by some, uh, and I think I saw this. I think blog by Nimrod Salk, who I think is also online, is saying that there is a financing gap of about two hundred billion dollars a year annually to to um, uh, to reach the SDGs. And there's lots of different types of capital are needed: for FDI, um, uh, domestic capital, but also DFI, international DFI. And we need to understand the impact that that that, that, that those DFIs have, both for uh, steering DFIs into particular areas, but also for monitoring what they're doing and for evaluating uh, afterwards, so for accountability on what they have done. Um, and it's pretty hard to sort of say, well, take these objectives that I mentioned, the, the, the unicorn objectives that were there, um, is uh, is to sort of assess each individual objective. Um, but you could perhaps. Uh, bring evidence together, and maybe we haven't done that enough. And that's sort of so. I think those are one of the or two things that are missing from the literature on the impact of DFIs is actually bring it all together, bring all these 
these these individual assessment techniques together and say what uh, what together do they actually say about investment by DFIs in say Uganda, for example. Um, and secondly, what is missing um, is that we don't really um, these assessment techniques don't really take into account the policy environment within which these investments take place. So um, uh, the, the input output models um, are uh, don't say um, well you have bigger impact if the policy context is uh, is 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 better than if the, if the policy context isn't that good. And that has been unlike other types of literatures that look at the impact of international financial flows as well. So. Um, and this is something that, that I worked on uh, uh, about a decade ago when we were advising um, the Secretary of State on, on CDC reform at that stage, um, um, is, um, is, is that you, you, you can look at the impact of foreign direct investment, the impact of aid going into other countries, and the impact of DFIs, um, sort of loans and equity. And um, there are different types of studies have been undertaken for different types of flows. Um, and for FDI and aid, there are a lot of macro studies and also studies that that talk about um, the policy environment within which these 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 investments take place. Not so for DFIs, and that's a gap. So particularly the yellow uh, box um, is a gap. I did also identified a gap in red, the red box um, for the macro studies, but that is being developed now in the last decade a bit more. Um, so. Um, uh, so if we think about uh, what I mentioned earlier about bringing these assessment techniques together, one way to do that is to sort of to argue that um, that these, these, these assessment, assessment techniques have different objectives and they all have their both positive aspects and their more challenging and negative aspects. So they can do certain things, but they can't do others. And if we then go to, down to the positive column, so the third column, um, then there are quite a lot of positive aspects of these techniques, so things that they can do. Uh, so if you think about uh, interviews with companies, they can provide you with narratives of how an investment may have a catalyzing impact. Um, if you look at, um, at the annual reports of DFIs, they look at the, the annual reports of their investee companies, where well, you get a good picture of what these, these um, if you harmonize your standards, uh, harmonize your, your impact standards, that, that uh, you get a good picture of, of what's being supported inside. The device, but of course, Petty will later say that it may, it may also be difficult there. Um, and then, if you have some of the macroeconometric studies, uh, and input output models, they, they provide maybe perhaps more better estimates of the indirect effects. And bringing this all together, um, you can then um, um, uh, get a bigger, a better picture. So, if we do that, um, I, I sometimes say I think that you can get a quite a positive uh, story. Um, 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 but it perhaps needs to be done more in a targeted way. So that's perhaps one element in, in a in a research agenda. Um, so uh, there are these anecdotal types of evidence that basically say that the chairman of, of Celtel or MTN, uh, a big telecommunications company now, of course, um, but but in, in the early 2000s wasn't, they got this, this anchor investment from CDC and we, uh, that has catalyzed much more investment. And, and now look at what, how big these telecommunications have become. Um, there are fantastic statistics in DFI annual reports. Uh, at the finance companies employed 2.6 million employees, and through these input output models um, that, that, um, that, that, that are now being used by DFIs, you can calculate that these these, these create 8.6 million indirect, indirect jobs. Um, and there are a range of other uh, things that, that you can do. You can look at individual investments. Um, we, we looked at Uganda Bogoya hydropower plant, and I wrote sort of in terms of reference uh, for a study, uh, and which was. Which basically showed that that yes, you could create jobs directly in operation of a hydropower plant, but indirectly you create uh, you create a lot a lot more jobs uh, through the productivity effects that that investment has. So the multipliers, but also the indirect effects, and um, uh, and there are, you can also use macroeconomic regressions. And we've done uh, some of the studies there that suggest that um, that DFIs um, can um, uh, have uh, have a macroeconomic impact and if you compare it to the to the literature on aid um the impacts are about the same but certainly not less so we estimated that a 10 billion increase uh, euro increase in in investment in africa would raise productivity and incomes by about a quarter of a percent um and these 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 estimates can be used sometimes in the policy debate um uh, you can look at uh, data intelligently. You can look at it before, after. You can sort of see when the DFI investment goes up. You can see whether the gross fixed capital formation uh, also goes up. So look at it in an intelligent way. That of course doesn't take into account other factors. So you need to have macro uh, or micro econometric studies uh, uh, to to account for multiple factors, um, which I've discussed previously. 
And these types of the, um, uh, these these estimates um, can sometimes feed, uh, 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 get themselves into the uh, into the to the debate. Um, and so these these estimates that are suggested on the on the, the macro level, for example, um, were used um, uh, by the Secretary of State in Parliament uh, to also justify a, um, a capital increment uh, for for uh, CDC uh, at that time. Um, and uh, and so there are some other outlets that 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 uh, that, that use that. Um, and I think there are some positive sides to to that, um, but of course, macroeconomic regression doesn't tell the whole story. And I think we need to develop the literature further. And that's going to be the last few slides of my presentation. On my argument is that um, that DFIs um, uh, aren't operating um, and shouldn't be operating uh, as isolated actors, um, and they are whole. Uh, they are amongst a whole range of actors um, uh, in a system of local international support organisations. Um, that said, of course, DFIs themselves have grown in size and they are increasingly seen as part of the solution to global challenges, not just like a, a, a investing in individual firms here or there in, in some countries, but actually the, the shareholders want them to solve global challenges like climate change, jobs crisis, macroeconomic crisis, the health crisis now. Um, and, um, uh, and to some extent, the DFIs are changing. Um, uh, Neil Gregory hopefully will talk a bit more about ISC 3.0 and the market creation uh, that they, the, the upstream work that, they, that they're doing. Um, CDC, um, when when I started looking at that um, in the early 2000s, it had almost been privatized then. It um, it had only had 25 employees. Now it's got about, I think Betty may, um, may correct me, but about three, between three and 500 uh, employees. And it's a very, di very different CDC. Um, whilst DFIs are doing a lot of work on screening investment and thinking about where to invest, and they do also a lot of work on monitoring performance um, after the financial closure and, and also an impact, they do perhaps they pay much less systematic attention to understanding, supporting and influencing the local policy context during the project cycle. Uh, and that is, I think, despite the fact that, um, that evidence suggests in the economic literature that, that economic progress depends on policy and social context around an investment. Uh, some countries can use uh, uh, any type of investment really well because they've got put a good policy context. Other countries won't be able to do that. It will remain an enclave investment and it will, there won't not, will not be spillovers. And I think my, my feeling is that 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 debate has been lacking from the literature on the impact of uh, DFIs, unlike uh, the debate on the role of policy in FDI. And I've done a lot of work also in my PhD was on the impact of foreign direct investment. Um, and um, and 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 uh, and so we we talk uh, we we provide three examples here of where I think the literature on DFIs could be extended. Um, so first of all, um, the, it's really important to um, to highlight the impact of um, uh, of uh, going to the next yeah um, of productivity spillovers. So what is really important to um, um, uh, to realize is that um, the impact. Uh, the wider impacts of the device isn't just the jobs that they create or support in, an, in, the, in their FST companies. It's also what happens in the wider economy. Uh, it's when their investment have uh, uh, productivity spillovers to the local firms that, that perhaps supply them. Um, and, uh, and so literal FDI su suggests that, a, um, um, that if you increase foreign ownership in a particular sector, uh, then the local firms will gain from that. Uh, there will be uh, uh, productivity spillover because of the technology transfer that might take place. Um, but those those spillovers are not automatic or direct. Um, and um, and it all depends uh, on the context. Um, that's where it all depends uh, comes comes back. It depends on which sector um, the, the DFI or the, or the foreign investor is in, located in. It depends on the the extent to which there are local linkages to the to the local um, local economy. It depends uh, uh, to, to the extent to which there is financial development um, uh, in the in the country. Whether there is training and labour mobility between the firms that are that you invest in and the local firms, and whether there is technological uh, and innovation cap capabilities in the local firms that are supplying perhaps these these bigger firms, and there are firm specific other issues that, that play a role. Now this this literature can be um, can be uh, taken from the DFI uh, from the FDI context and trans transformed into the DFI uh, literature, and DFIs aren't necessarily uh, couldn't should, wouldn't be necessarily uh, neutral players. Um, they could also influence these um, these these channels, 
and working with other organizations, other other uh, organizations, they can also uh, influence those channels. They can help build local linkages with support from from uh, from aid and other uh, and other factors. And supporting the actions of African leaders, African governments, uh, and recognizing that there are many different approaches in the different countries. And so I've uh, so visited a range of countries um, around economic transformation, and you can say that, for example, the mega investments uh, in Mozambique um, uh, on the left hand side were met with a lot of uh, policy action um, um, from the government side. Whereas if you go on the right hand side, uh, the Tanzania and Ethiopia, um, you get a bit more dirigist and more active approaches uh, uh, towards um, towards the investment. And so DFIs can can go with the grain. They can work with the policy environment um, and not only invest, but also work with other organizations uh, and, and, and local policy actors to to make that investment work for development um, as well. Um, and um, another example, the second example I'd like to say to mention is uh, is something that I've um, highlighted in a previous lecture um, um, uh, with uh, with which I've done with my colleagues uh, Sharon Raga and Phyllis Papa David, um, and I presented a, a, a seminar, um, Victor, which is the argument I made was that the impact of FDI on development, for example, on human capital formation, um, is positive, particularly about um, um, about uh, tertiary and secondary education um, uh, enrollment rates. But the impact is much stronger if you already have um, a high endowment of, of skills to work with. Um, and that is also likely to be the case for DFIs. So if your, your investment for DFIs work, uh, work better, um, uh, have bigger impact, if you can coordinate your actions um, with uh, a, 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 an economic structure that has high skills, technology, um, and you and 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 there can be coordination that can be taking place, um, and you can then upgrade the the, um, the operations of of your investment investee company. Uh, you can work more with the local economy if there is more skills available, uh, and that can overall lead to high competitiveness and more development over time. Um, and. That is actually a bigger point that coordination of actors is a very big point. We looked at ODI um, uh, at, um, uh, at how economic transformation happens. Uh, and, and actually a lot happens at the sector level through coordination of actors, um, not just by isolated uh, investment or isolated uh, policy actions, it's by bringing uh, finance and policy together. And, um, and it's of course, you need to identify your investment really well. And DFIs are extremely good at that. And um, that's point one, correct identification of economic opportunities. They, they look where the private sector goes and that, that, that's fantastic. But you have factors two and six, uh, two to six as well. And ex actually, um, uh, whether that investment works or not, whether that sector transforms uh, into a successful sector, uh, actually is all dependent on the political economy. And it all depends on the the the, the, the action that, that takes place around this. Um, and if the political economy isn't right, that sector may not develop well and the potential won't be realized. If the political economy is working, um, then um, then that sector will, will be a, a stepping stone towards further national economic transformation. And so that depends uh, a, a coordination of actors, of, 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 um, um, of, of actors that the coordination problem needs to be, um, needs to be um, addressed. And so the question is sort of how do DFIs actually fit into this system? How can they collaborate with others to overcome the challenges? So they, they may make an investment and then they say, well, actually, the profitability of my investment is dependent on other factors. And so how do they then, um, uh, what do they then do? Are they then passive players or could it be more active players to, to achieve certain development of objectives? Um, and, and to some extent that is that is that is now um, that, that, that is working now. So in some DFIs are doing that. And in particular, we looked at uh, some greater detail um, uh, the impact on uh, or, or on, on uh, the IFC in the world, the wider uh, the wider World Bank group, and so um, and but it also plays a role between the European Commission aid and the EIB, um, FCDO grants and CDC um, uh, uh, or should be BII finance. So you've got the traditional aid grant providers and you've got the DFIs. And so the DFIs need to depend need, uh, need to depend on private sector, 
demand for for their finance um, so they need to work to some extent opportunistically whereas the traditional aid grant providers are more the create the, the strategic uh, creative uh, planners uh, they think about planning uh, an economy uh, and uh, uh, providing public goods with a long time horizon and so you need to bring these two mindsets together and you can undertake joint diagnostics and sort of think about where are the binding constraints and then perhaps uh, make commitments. For example, IC can make commitments and you can draw in technical assistance around that to sort of help with uh, making that investment work uh, as well. And there are some of these approaches that are being undertaken, um, cascade approach, financing for development. And actually, at, um, we, we, we could be doing much more to sort of uh, as a research community to analyze sort of what works in this context. How can you bring um, this together? And there's also a use of country platforms um, um, and uh, we've undertaken a study with the Stockholm Environment Institute um, that hopefully will be launched in the coming months um, uh, with, a co with a colleague, uh, Samantha Attridge, um, um, uh, uh, and, and others um, to sort of um, sort of how can DFI link to the national development plans and uh, one way to do is through country platforms that are being piloted. And Paul Collier was uh, was highly influential on that as well, I think. And sort of IC and CDC have been working, I think, together uh, around sort of providing technical advice upstream, but also thinking about a role for, for DFIs later on, for example, in Ethiopian telecoms. OK, that leads me to the final slide, um, uh, Victor. Um, and uh, and I realise that, of course, there's a lot in on the slides, uh, and I hope you, you get a chance to sort of um, uh, read, it, read it afterwards um, as well. Um, and uh, And of course, um, what I've been highlighting isn't um, uh, something that, uh, that that I can do on my own. Uh, it is actually the, the idea that we have a whole research community around this that 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 inter interacts with DFIs, um, uh, with with academia, with uh, think tanks, uh, and also um, sort of uh, working with uh, with um, with shareholders um, as well. So there is a, a demand for DFIs to achieve objectives. Um, such as, for example, sector transformation. And uh, and so the question really becomes, what could be the role, the strategic role of a DFI in sector transformation? And so there is an, a, a huge important policy agenda there um, in Africa. There's an AU 2063 transformation agenda. One of the policy tools is the content of free trade area that I'm working on at the mo a lot of, at the moment. Um, and it's hoping that um, that sector transformation can can really transform the African continent, which can then lead to job creation and development gains um, in a sustained way. Um, but what is then the role for DFIs in all of this? Um, um, what is their, their, their competitive advantage? Um, uh, what is their role? Uh, and so we need to understand that better um, uh, uh, in terms of um, um, uh, that they, that uh, in, in terms of literature that suggests that action on their own. Um, may or may not have the desired impact is dependent on, on the complementary policies. What is the link to industrial policy there? Second point, what are the DFIs in, as policy actors during the project cycle? I've seen a lot of work um, that DFIs are undertaking about the initial investment. Which investment should they take? I, I see much less of uh, um, explicitly of what DFIs are doing um, when that investment is taking place during the project cycle. And so shouldn't there be sort of um, a, a department for strategic interventions or strategic uh, relationships in these DFIs? And, and what type of action would, would, would help? Uh, what would be most effective? Um, thirdly, I think a very important agenda still remains mobilization of capital. I haven't uh, talked much about that, um, uh, but of course, the sort of the blended finance uh, literature that basically the, the, the premise there is that um, is that um, there are different types of capital. There's lots of capital spinning around uh, um, in in in, uh, uh, in in the city of London, elsewhere. Um, and the, how do you draw that capital down to where you want it to go? Um, and uh, and so how do you mobilize that capital, or perhaps better, how do you direct that capital towards, for example, climate action? Um, and and there are huge opportunities also in the African continent. Um, I did a paper with Carlos Lopez um, in, uh, last year. That's, that also suggests that Africa can now finally industrialize um, in a way that is um, th that can use renewable energy. Other continents haven't been able to do that. But of course, uh, the question is how, what combination of policies and finance can best support that, um, that transition? I think there are a couple of other agendas that, that I may not have touched on enough, but 
but that, that we will still come back to is about a counter-cyclical role. Um, um, I've touched on that about a decade ago during the global financial crisis. We looked at that also in the, during the COVID crisis is when other capitals withdrawn, can DFIs become more counter-cyclical and how can they be even more counter-cyclical and engineer a more inclusive and productive and sustainable recovery. And Stanford Griffith Jones has done a little work on that. I don't know whether she's online at the moment, but I think that's really important to, to highlight as well. And which maybe to some an elephant in the room, um, but to others, I think is also just part of the uh, part of the um, uh, uh, the the research agenda uh, going forward is is that the international DFIs that I've talked about are um, are are operating in a, in a wider context in which um, uh, there are other financiers, of course, um, as well, uh, and um, including the private sector, um, and there, there is uh, uh, so bonds, uh, sovereign bonds. Um, are happening a lot. A lot of so public debt is also increasing in 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 African countries now, also due to COVID. But also uh, uh, there have been Chinese financiers as well, and I think we need to um, understand that much better as well. Okay, the conclusions. Um, international DFIs have become more important over time, um, particularly the the ones those that are invested in the private sector. Uh, of course, also the African Development Bank. Uh, the African Bank is playing a much bigger role now. And their expected roles that they play in 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 sustainable development um, are changing, and so uh, that is something that we need to reflect. We need to think more on, um, partly because we haven't really sort of identified what changing role um, works best. Um, how can they can the advice best link with technical system providers? What what policy roles could they have? Um, and partly because we need to sort of perhaps help the advice along and sort of say this, these are um, what the literature tells us are important interventions for them to take. Um, and so um, we're hoping that uh, that we can advance this research agenda and there are lots of other uh, other elements that need to be uh, need to be looked at um, in the in the uh, in the years ahead. Um, I would say that whilst we looked at um, the sort of international DFIs for the private sector, I think this is more generally an important area for, for all DFIs. So rich research agenda, uh, I can't do it on my own uh, by all means. I'd like to sort of um, to contribute to this uh, as I've been doing from a practical uh, experience um, and also like to sort of bring um, sort of academic uh, w w uh, expertise in this and link it more, more widely to the policy perspectives and I'm really looking forward to sort of what the, uh, the representatives uh, from the African Development Bank, from the African research community and also from the DFIs that I've talked about a lot have to say and uh, and what they think are the important uh, issues that um, that need to be looked at and so that we jointly can think forward and of course there are a, a very range of networks that um, that 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 we're all Part of there's a private sector development research uh, a network that that IFC and other DFIs are uh, are leading. There's a, a network of European development finance institutions that that hold annual conference with ODI every year, um, and there are a whole range of other networks that I think we need to join up uh, together with SOAS, and I'd um, and, and and I'd like to really contribute to that. So over to you, Victor, to chairing this um, this um, uh, this the rest of the session. I'm looking forward to the comments, and I'm also hoping to sort of contribute to the chat. Uh, get the questions in the chat um, and of course to liaise with all of you, uh, students, um, um, uh, but also uh, uh, professional officials um, 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 everywhere uh, in the UK, uh, but more globally and of course in particularly in the, in, in the, in the poorer countries, but in, in Africa and, and elsewhere. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Victor. Uh, uh, over to you.